Tina Arena. Who doesn't know who she is? Who doesn't adore her? She is actually an icon of this country. She's been around for 48 years in the entertainment industry. Before we started the interview today, the Nova Studios was in a little bit of, um, I guess you could call it a flap. I've never had a guest that had everyone acting the way they did when they knew Tina was coming or saw that Tina was here. So I found that hilarious. And watching her navigate people fawning over her, the realness of Tina is impenetrable. She's so interested in you as the person. And after we did the interview, when the mics were off, we talked about something Mary Kustis and I talked about and giving compliments and saying thank you instead of, oh, no, don't, don't. Because Tina does that. She, oh, no, 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 no. Humble, which is lovely. But it's okay to say, you know, you're pretty good shit. <laughs> as you'll hear in this interview, you know, she's been through a lot. And she's copped a lot in this industry. And she still comes back stronger than ever. Enjoy. Let me know what you think. Here's Tina Arena. Filipina Lydia Arena, welcome. Thank you. Bienvenue. Bienvenue. Benvenuti. Benvenuta. Welcome. How many languages do you speak? <laughs> Not well. Not well. But how many? Because... Three, including English. In including English. Mm. Any Swedish? No, I try... Is that a hard one? Yeah, it is a hard one. It's Do they have really a different hard. alphabet? Yes, I a think, little bit different. Yeah, yeah. But it's also the pronunciation and, you know, my partner is very Swedish. She was born in the south of Sweden. And they have a particular accent. Yeah, right, the north of Sweden. Yeah, and like the north of Stockholm oh. has one accent and then the south. It's like any country. Yeah, yeah. yeah wherever and you go. And our the, accents the, the, are really, our accents are vary really starting well. to yeah. widen, aren't they? Without a doubt. So, no, Swedish is a, is a tough one to get around. Occasionally, because some words are based on the English language, I'll know the subject matter of what he's on about when he speaks to his family or friends, but any further than that, it's a bit hard. I can't navigate that one. And I think it's a sonic thing for me because I'm the yeah. Latin and the languages I speak are, are Latin-based. And you're a lyricist and a, a, well, a singer, so you're oral. It's just my ear yeah, is just ear. attuned yeah. to a certain sound. There's certain people that are really like that. Yeah, so. and it's, it's true. Like I can't speak German. I'm lost. Yeah, right. Totally German's lost. an easy one as far as languages go. Mm. Matthias speaks German. I've yeah. been because, oh, no, I don't speak German. I'm like, you're a quarter German. Of course you speak German. <laughs> well, yeah. And he does. He speaks really well. But uh, do a lot of Europeans speak a lot of other languages or, or just maybe just English? Yeah, no, 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 the... they do. Yeah. They do. Well, they're yeah. close to it, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're so isolated. That is. It's a, it's a beautiful thing and also a wretched thing. Is it true that you started in entertainment in 1974? Good Lord. I hope not. Because if that is true, it's mm. 50 years this year. No. Well, then it's about 1976, I think. Okay. Or it's coming up then. early sort of 77. How old were you? The no. first time I think I was on TV, I would have been six, seven. So you really don't know much else no. than being known. Correct. Being in the public eye. <laughs> Brutal. And you've been in all, really, quite <laughs> yeah. the stages of the love, the hate, because this country is incredibly yeah. good, I guess the word would be, at tall poppy syndrome and cutting. I think, I think Australians have become masters of the tall poppy. Mm. I guess it's a, the English thing, you know, the colonisation thing, which sort of drips down and drips through generations and so forth and I'm not British I don't have any British blood so it's something that is very unfamiliar to me yes. I don't I've never understood it at no, all and I've wouldn't. always been like why and why Mary would you Christus was on here and she <clears throat> as a Greek woman was explaining in her family life mm. and just how much the entertainment and the 
to perform is so revered and so... And I remember any um, Italians or Greeks that I knew growing mm. up, if we all went to someone's house, they would have their kids performing and mm. everyone would be clapping. And we just thought it was really odd because yeah. we were like, oh, don't do that. You, you know, you love yourself kind of thing. It is so taught yeah. from a very young age it's to not... behaviour. Yeah, look, art is a very, very big part of our cultures, uh, yeah. whether it be Greek. Mary and I have been friends for an awfully long time and we've grown together in, you know, different points in our lives and and so forth and I've really enjoyed watching her really evolve. She's an amazing woman. Yeah, she's an extraordinary woman. She's highly, highly intelligent. She's extremely yes. articulate. She's a wonderful observer. She's quite poetic in the way in which she sees things and also hard too, but I think that that also comes from me too. I, I, I see things in a very poetic fashion and there's also a lot of hardness too because I think as kids and so forth, when you are inherently artistic, you are ostracised. So I grew up, I wasn't a, a particularly difficult child, certainly not from what I'm told, I think I was, I was vocal. I was expressive. But did I you express like, my myself, my mind, my thoughts, which were not so always not in line. Yeah, not being difficult though. Like, were you a go with the flow? Do what your parents told you. I challenged of, them. You did, but you yeah. never rebelled. No, I never rebelled to the fact where I put my finger up at them and went, you know, f f you. Them. You know, I didn't do that because I, I, I what for? You know, our children do that to us. You know, I mean, my son said that to me and I kind of looked at him and went, pardon? <laughs> I would have done more than just look at him. I yeah, I know, right but now. I just looked at him and I just said, you know, yeah, was, what for? It was just, it yeah. was a moment of anger. I mean, every child, especially of this generation, especially. will tell their parents to f*** off. Yes. We would never have thought about it. Well, oh, we my... were from a generation of being hit yeah. really yeah. acceptably. We were, yeah, it was acceptably. a very acceptable thing, yeah. behaviour to mm. do for parents and mm. not just parents. You could be hit by your neighbour like, and your parents go, thank oh, you for uncle, doing that. Oh, your uncle, your family, you'd see, Jeff? you know, you'd be yeah. sitting at the dinner table and you'd say something and you'd, all of a sudden you'd see a hand fly over and go, Doosh, yeah, like that and it'd be like, <laughs> it wasn't hard. And, and the would, action was well, like... you wouldn't do it because you, you knew what was going to happen correct. if you correct. got out of line. Correct. But today you can't say anything or do anything because basically today it is excruciatingly painful to parent today when a society tells you how to parent. To do it, yeah. I don't see the correlation there. I don't see why some sort of a structure or why society should tell me how to parent my child. Was there a big difference in France to Australia? Like you would have done the majority of your son in France, is that right? Yeah, I mean, he's back there now. Um, he would be an adult now, wouldn't he? Yeah, he is. Because when we first met, he mm. was, I think, 15. And struggling in school yeah. in Australia, struggled you'd just in gotten school. here, really. Yeah. Back, you'd yeah. back here and him to live here. Yeah. He didn't like private school at all. He didn't that understand. Yeah, he was that... really quite lost. There's a very different school system in France. Is it true that they start very early and they it's do. very um, It's very rigorous. Yeah. It is highly intellectual because, you know, I think that they, I mean, clearly they have a history to which they're proud of, even if they're, yeah. even if it, you know, parts of it were extraordinarily bleak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Napoleon, very, yes. very bleak. Very. You know, the French Re Revolution, brutal, very bleak. you know, yes. everything. Australians tend to have a, a history to which we're struggling to even acknowledge to this day, or if we do today, we over-acknowledge it. So there's a constant sense of imbalance. You can't take away what happened in the past, you know, and that whole colonial history and perspective, it does seep through the generations. But I guess... Yeah, they call that generational trauma, don't they? Yeah, and, and it's very real. And also having a child that, you know, was educated in yeah. two different continents yeah. here. And he loved the primary school. I had him in a Catholic school in, in Mooney Ponds called St Monica's. And whilst it was faith-driven, it wasn't rammed down their throats, which yeah, is what which I liked really about it. Yeah. 
And because um, when Catholic school gets it right, they get it right. My God, when they get it right, they really get it. Because right. the original, I had the best time at school. Yeah. I went to a Catholic school. I had the the best time. The original. Catholic school was started by Irish nuns yes. for poor children who Correct. could not, you know, couldn't Correct. afford to go to school. And unfortunately, it went in one direction, but it didn't start like that. It no. started as a real service mm. that the Catholic Church provided mm. to children who would never normally get an education. Correct. And then it was taken to many different countries mm. and, you know, became what it became. Like my father went to a Catholic school and we used to get beaten on a daily basis by the nuns. So, you know, and then... It's so mad, isn't it? But then you have these amazing stories. So when the Catholic Church and their school gets it right, it's because it's, they're doing it for the right reasons. Absolutely. So I found that Gabriel's primary years were really beautiful and he had a really beautiful time. Then when it got into the senior years, I don't think I made the right decision in putting him into a boys' school. I think that was quite destructive for okay. him. And I can honestly say, I don't mean, I don't know who, I'm not a teacher by any stretch of the imagination. It is an extraordinary profession that is undervalued. Very. But I will say this, I don't believe that in 2024 those private schools of just girls and just boys work. It doesn't work. Oh, I, agree. I could so not agree more. Did you watch he, the Four Corners thing last no, week? No, I haven't wa- I don't watch Ooh, te- Australian TV. Right. I actually right. don't. So I am I'm not at all the best person to speak to with things like that because I I get quite mad. Yeah. So I have to actually keep myself away from that kind yeah. of information. I'm going through a phase at the moment, which is perhaps detrimental to me, but where I'm really struggling to see what the media are doing and how they are bringing things and agendas forward. I'm so tired of it. Yeah. I find it undernourishing. I feel it's impoverished to a point where I'm very, very, very frightened for the future. Yeah. And I'm at sort of saying to myself, and I would say this to anyone in the education department, I would be pulling that template apart and I would Mm. very, very quickly be encouraging boys and girls and whatever somebody feels that they are to actually be together Together, and to put everything of those agendas or whatever they are to the back and for people to just be people mm-hmm. and to learn to respect one another yes, a little people. bit more humbly yeah. and a little bit more honourably. Mm-hmm. I think they have been fed with so much information that I think that the level of confusion within any Western society today is massively detrimental to our revolution. So my son's back in a public school and he's, you know, he struggles with school. Mm -hmm. He doesn't like it. He's not really a big fan. There are some things he's very good at, other things he's completely not interested in. Is he musical? I think he is. I think he tends to stay away from it because it's his mum's job and he sort of goes, oh, well, that's mum's job so I can't really go there, which I've always said, don't think you you can't go there because I'm there because you can. Because you can. (laughs) But he doesn't think, does he think in a way, I I don't want anyone to expect that I have to because of my mum and he's therefore kind of pulling back. Good question. I've never asked him, Mm. Evie, to be really honest with you. I've just kept asking him, Just I just beg him to stay at school. Yeah. Because he does want to leave. Right. Yeah. What does he want to do? Doesn't know. Okay. So it's best to stay at yeah. school until yeah, you figure I that think out. So. And that's a direct consequence yeah. of the shutdown of Victoria. In so he 20. lost. He was one of those children of that yeah. generation that really was profoundly damaged yeah, by it yeah. and chose to go back overseas right. as a result of it. Right. Yeah. And, and go to school to finish. Yeah. Because well, they believe. that he's finishing. Well, he's others... not. He's got another year to go. I'm just hoping that he finishes this yeah. year. You know, but it's. I'm telling you, it's pulling teeth. Yeah, gosh. it's pulling teeth. Oh, uh, I, 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 it's not been a fun time. What music do you listen to? Oh wow, 
All sorts of things, really. I mean, Matthias and I will scour different things. There's a great English rock band called Nothing But Thieves that I absolutely love. I love music that's real, that's very organic. Okay. That yeah. is very, very much. Underproduced, do you mean? Or... Perhaps just a little bit more the essence. I don't care about Spotify and all of those things are very fashion. This doesn't interest me, you know. I mean, I just not. I'm not interested in one artist yeah. suffocating or do your moods holding, dictate... hostage, holding a whole sort of top ten hostage. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. interest me and it's not I don't mean that disrespectfully. No. I'm I'm just I love watching people do different things as opposed to so experimentation is something that I okay. listen to. Yeah. I love classical. I I love great organic rock and roll. You know, I'm a big fan of music of the 80s and 90s only because it really was a time before digital came in and really kind of took over. Yeah, yeah. And basically... It was dabbled in, in digital. Correct, like, yeah. But I mean, it was more yeah, a sound. Correct. Than a... The 80s and so forth and the, the 70s and the 80s, there, there was an instrument called, the keyboard called the Fairlight. Yeah. Which was invented by an Australian man. In really? Sydney. Peter, somebody, his name escapes me. Is it a synth? It's a synthesizer. Yep. And the Michael Jackson record, you know, mm-hmm. Thriller and... Da, da, oh, da, yeah, da, yeah. Da, 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 all those keyboards, that's a Fairlight. Right. So, Peter, this machine consequently was was invented by him and you could program and get strings on it and guitar sounds. So it was the very first machine. But in that period when that machine came out, which was used by Kate Bush, Kate yes. Bush used to use it extensively through her music. Everybody was using it. But what they were doing is that they were amalgamating this machine and real instrumentation. So they were marrying yeah, both yeah. things together. So that's why everything was so beautifully mm-hmm. lush. Yeah. And whereas today everything's it, done on a program, yeah, yeah. on a computer, and everybody's been educated, go, you too can be a producer and you too can have hits, which I don't really believe. Yeah, right. And I believe that that's also a reason why the value of music has profoundly gone down because... The technology is basically said to everybody, you can do it. Well, no, actually, not everybody can do it. And it's a big part of the reason why music today, nothing really says anything. There's I, a lack of vision. There's I a lack of at rebel. the music today. And I find myself just going back to old music all the time. Despair, that's a wonderful word well, that that's, you're using. Because it's exactly it. It is. And I, I get depressed over the fact that Absolutely. there's no great music that Absolutely. inspires. And I start questioning, am I just old now? Like, or wh- If I hear that one more time, I go, listen, you too are going to get To my age as well. It ain't something you're going to be able to avoid. It's got nothing to do with age. It's the fact that you and I grew up in a beautiful time before Spotify, before technology took everything over where curation and choosing and putting people together and making things masterfully and watching the evolution of artists or artists on their journey evolve. Yeah. Yeah. That was a beautiful thing to be able to do. We don't get that. We have 100,000 new songs on the market every single day. Nothing is properly curated. Everybody, then you have these platforms saying, make your own playlist. And then when you don't know, they will suggest to you and say, we think you should listen to this, some algorithm. And I go, the algorithm, what the f*** are you trying to tell me what to listen to? I don't want to listen to that person. So I've got my phone or whatever and I'm pressing and I'm pressing and I'm going, why can't you f***ing play what I want you to play? And then I go, that <laughs> boom, that's gone. Tina so is throwing see, her I, phone right no, now. No, but well, seriously, yeah, I can't I do it. I can't operate it. And yeah. then I go, I'm stupid. Yeah, and then you are. And then that's I just, you question yourself and your age abilities I'm and all that stupid. kind of thing. Stupid. It's just that I do not want to be dictated to by an yeah. algorithm to tell me what 
I want to listen to. I'm yep. sorry. Yeah, it's just well, not I I think thing. you know that's why old school vinyl and cassettes or even CDs Bring it these days like they're so <laughs> great. You know, you have to still get up and change them, that's which cool. I like. You know, when I said I asked myself, am I just getting old? I often then answer myself and say, well, no, because when you were listening to music in the 70s and 80s and there would be some parents who'd go, oh, the music, it's just not what it used to be. There was majority of parents, especially <laughs> mine, who'd be like, oh, they were loving not the same music, but just as many 80s artists who maybe came up through the ranks that I didn't know of, but mm. had been around for mm. 20 years that mm. they'd known of, that were, mm. you know, the reiteration of, of their their careers. There is a real divide between mm. the parents. I mean... There's I'm, a massive distance now. There's some that really get into, like, <clears> and that's where you're watching <throat> the Pink and the Taylor Swift concerts where the parents were going with their kids. Mm. And I haven't seen that in a really long time because I've been watching my niece, my niece mostly because she loves music, going to concerts. She goes all the time. She spends mm. all of her money How on concerts. How old is she? She's 27, I think, now. Okay. Mm. Um, but she's likes death metal and all of this music. That I don't get any of that. Like, yeah. you, Rach, you would love yeah. my niece. You would love yeah. her. And you're similar age, so, you you know, but... I haven't seen um, what I was seeing in the last month with Pink and Taylor Swift where there was fathers as well as mums going along and loving the music just as much. That's not even a handful of artists also, that have connected I, no, generations. I, I, well, you know, the Taylor, I didn't go to the show because I don't suffer from FOMO. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a little bit of it is that. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm going right, to see this. Like, yeah. And there's a real problem out there today and FOMO is very real. I didn't yeah, realise it. I don't have it. FOMO. I don't. I have the opposite of FOMO, yeah, fear of not staying at home. <laughs> I have that. Like sh I, when I'm out, I'm like, damn, I wish I was at home right now. <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking. But I also find, do you find that, Tina, at this age that you become this really happy person in your space? Like you don't, yeah. you, you're happy to potter and yeah. to, to make things, yeah. build things, cook yeah. things, yeah. Um, do things much. for your loved ones yeah. in that yeah. space and you've just so happy to be yeah. simple. Yeah, I've made a massive transition in January, which wasn't easy mm. for me at all, but I think it had to be done. I sold the family home. Yeah, right. And The um, one you grew up in? No, the one I've spent, you know, that Gabriel partly oh, grew right. up in. that so family. Forth. Yes, yeah. okay. Where you, the pool. Yeah, yeah, Remember the, yeah. Babe, yeah, the day yeah. you and I were in the pool for yeah. hours? See, just, I thought that that was just a, a my quite... God, how hours. hot was it? It was Indian brilliant. Really? That's my that's my favourite day. Someone actually, I have a friend here from um, Sydney at the moment and she said to me, she's going to the Golden Plains. I think it's Golden Plains. It's something at Meredith, the festival, you know, just because you camp. For three days, and it's just oh. music. And like I said, and it's going to be thirty nine degrees every day. Yeah, I'm and not I said sure to her, like you, were literally, that is my worst nightmare. Me my too. worst nightmare. Yeah. She said, oh, it's funny because it's something I love so much. And I was like, that's wonderful. And she said, what do you like? What would be your perfect? And I said, my perfect day or holiday mm. would be in a pool, yeah, talking, yeah, being able to eat. Yeah. Good food yeah. and see my dogs yeah. close by, me if too. not in the pool with yeah. me. And that was our day, which is our day because my was in the pool <laughs> with us. Day. Mm. Yes, and if your and dogs you had been there, beautiful food, exactly. You know, I would have had them in the pool as well. Exactly. I don't know. It's a different thing. I can't. I've had a very full life. I think that I needed time to actually get to know who I really was, and that's not. The woman that's on stage, no, or putting records together, or trying to collaborate and create records and music. Because I love the journey of creation. That's actually you one do? of my yeah, I do. Yeah. I love it. I'm quite an introvert. I think I'm an well, an introverted extrovert. Yeah, I'm a, I'm an introvert. Yeah, because introverts um, are completely fine on their own and to give yeah. themselves. Yeah, and I've become stimulation. like that. Yeah. It's certainly in these last few years where I've just slowed down and taken the time to reflect. So moving out of the family home, as I was saying, selling that and really sizing down, like I'm talking when I say to you that I sold my furniture. 
Did you do marketplace? Like, did people get? No, I sold it. I sold it. I sold it to. I was so hoping that someone had to come along because she loved it. This isn't who is Mina Patina. (laughs) What's this name? (laughs) And then turning up at your mansion and going, "I can't do it." Is that? Is that? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't have haggled if I'd known. Yeah, no, no. So I, d- I did. I got rid of everything. I've sized down. I probably threw out other furniture and stuff that could have furnished another house. But what about boxes? Did you have? Okay, I've got a storage place. I've reduced my storage. I cleaned out one storage, mm. went into another storage. But did you find that storage is a funny thing? Because you look at your old storage and go, this has been in here for how long? Why Do I still need it? Okay, so to give you an idea of what I did is uh, a friend of mine who's helping me. She ordered a, an industrial paper shredder truck to come to the house. So I shred 30 years worth of paperwork. And some of that paperwork that was shredded was probably paperwork that had some stuff on it. It was pretty hairy yeah. when I look back now yeah. and so forth. Did you look it, at it? I looked I looked at some things yeah. and because otherwise you was just absolutely for weeks, aren't you? horrified with some of the things, particularly my first managerial collaboration. Um, when I looked at the paper trail and some of the exchanges and the figures and the contracts and so forth. I don't know how I am still alive today to be able to do what it is that I do, to have had an audience that have been so unbelievably gracious to follow me on the journey. I don't know how I didn't lose my f***ing mind (laughs) in all sincerity. Wow. Well... And that was a monumental act for me because I could have probably kept that paperwork. Yeah, yeah but I could have opened up a can, can of worms, of yeah. worms yeah. that would have made yeah. the head of the music industry spin. Oh. And I went do I want to spend is that yeah, is that the next you? few years after having suffered yeah. the way that I suffered and my family as a direct consequence, do I really want to yeah. go through that again? Nah, because I go, at the end of the day, karma does catch up with everybody. It really does. So I just went, truck back in, yeah. boom, filled up the bins with all this paperwork and boom, off it was shredded. But a few documents were kept. Okay, okay, good. Women in music, mm-hmm. can I say that I think that you've stayed very humble or grounded, number one, because you have a family that, you know, doesn't come from fame themselves. So you're no. not a Nepo baby no, at all. No, I'm not a Nepo baby. Um, can I say nothing came easy nothing. to you? Nothing. still doesn't. It still doesn't. No, not at all. It's not a given. It never. No, no, no. It's never been a but given with me. But I think that's me. why people love you so much that even – didn't, may not have. Like, I don't think there's a person that has ever heard your voice that wouldn't say, well, look, love her voice, love her voice. But no, she's not for me. Like, you know, she came from Young Talent Time and, oh, God, like, you know, Mm. I don't think there's many people around that wouldn't say, but now Mm. she is tenacious. She's a hardworking artist and she's fucking talented. And you can see how hard you've worked and how nothing has come easy. You've been decimated by... This country, Mm. enough to move to another country Mm. and completely Mm. succeed over there, enough Mm. for us to want you back and you come back to us. Mm. I would have slapped us in the face, Mm. but success is the best revenge, I guess. And just, Mm. and your acceptance of people being so fallible and people being who they are and accepting, not having to like the tall poppy thing. In, in this country or the media or how, you know, the record industry treats women, but you still just accepted it enough to still work in it mm. and be successful mm. in it. And there's a real difference because you could have completely cut your nose off to spite your face. Sure, absolutely. And some people do. Yeah, a lot do, Evie. A lot do. Yeah. On reflection, it's been particularly difficult growing up in this country as a female musician unnecessarily difficult, I think. Yeah. And I think um, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because I 
just intuitively knew what I wanted for a very long time. And when I was demonstrating that kind of personality and ideas, it was very, very much a man's world. Yeah. And men that were not particularly in favour of women like myself who had an idea. So they were quite dismissive of me. And it's funny, you know, because I don't like the gratuitousness of decimating or putting a male down because it, it saddens me yeah. to do that. I yeah. don't. Some of my best friends are males mm -hmm. and my partner now is one of the most beautiful men I know. He's sensitive, he's mm -hmm. open, he's articulate, he has extraordinary respect for women and he lost his mother when he was 25 and still to this day I see him struggle because she's not there mm. and he can't get on the phone and go, mm. hey, mum, I've had mm. a shit day or mama, how are you? But it's really sad that those days were spent with such a waste of time mm. in bravado mm. and machoism mm. that honestly... And it's a shame for them. It's a shame for them. You know what? I don't see it so much for me because I think ultimately I came away probably a more grounded yes. and evolved human. Evolved, I would like yes. to be able Learned. to think that, God, give me, if there's something I've learned, it's maybe it gave me the grace that I didn't have at that time because I was pretty forthright and I was quite rebellious. Yeah, great. Now looking that's back, when which you is found great. It. Yeah, and, and and musicians are supposed to be rebellious. Yeah, that's right. Well, and not a lot gets done if you don't rebel a bit. Correct. Or, you know. That really saddened me and the bullying saddened me. Yeah. And I, I was yeah pretty severely bullied and I was even. In the industry? Yeah. yeah. And I was, I mean, the last time I had a real... I had a massive bullying incident when I was on stage playing Evita because some person thought that he was entitled enough to speak to me in a fashion that was really not at all called for. So for me, I look at things like that and I go, at a certain point, where is your respect? Yeah. Where is the respect? So playing Ava Perron who did what she did and being bullied at the same time mm. in real life. Yeah, in real How time. How did you reconcile that or did you just get on? I took one show off, a matinee on a Saturday because I couldn't get out of bed. Mm. I was in physical shock. So it was pretty And that pretty was just one, one show you missed, that's all? I only missed one show, yeah. You told me in the pool that day I asked mm. you, it was like I was interviewing you. Mm. Like what's the best I was part you've by ever, it. ever had? You played like your yeah. favorite role yeah. ever, and you yeah. said Ava Peron. Ava Peron, and what a life she had! You know, yeah. how inspiring. Married to Juan Peron was in with Adolf Hitler, <laughs> and you know, and hiding all of those killers hiding them in Argentina. He was the one because Argentina had an extraordinary influx mm. of all those generals and yes. stuff that instigated the killings yes. and so forth. So he, you know, yes. he looked after them and allowed them to come in there. So it's no wonder she died at 33 because she obviously knew what was going on. No doubt she was a highly, highly intelligent woman. He was so physically promiscuous that he shagged anything that moved apparently. So she ultimately died of cervical cancer because right. he transmitted yeah, brought, yeah. a sexual disease to her. She got very oh. unwell. And then to top it off for me, I think the, the icing on the cake was when I heard that he'd had her lobotomised on his oh, second yeah. presidential election where she was physically propped up in the audience, which is the last scene of the show where you see Eva Peron in that dress and quite grey and yeah. very thin in the face and the lighting is adapt so you look almost corpse-like. And she died very soon after that and he was then announced president for the second time because of her, but then... She went. It's a disgraceful, yeah. disgraceful part of history. But that's just one story of that's so ma one. many similar things. Now, we've run out of time, but oh. I want to um, talk to you about your tour. Yes. Because 
you had to cancel for the very first time in your life. Mm. How did that feel for you? Because you are, like, you love your fans and you love to work. I love to work. So that would have been a really hard, but you know how important health is. Did you have to be told, Tina, your health is more important than anything? Yeah, I did. Or did you just know? No, I had to be told because I didn't realise the severity of what was going on. I um, I had performed two shows of the tour. I had done Sydney, uh, Manly at the Barracks, and then the night, the evening after I was at the Perth Concert Hall and then the next day I flew home in absolute excruciating pain. I'll never forget it. And then the day after I was hospitalised at the Epworth and I was in ICU for about six days, nearly seven days. Oh, my God. My kidney was very close to exploding because it was highly, highly infected. I wasn't aware of how bad it actually was. So the doctors... I actually looked at them and I said, I'm on the road. I've got 10 days to recover. And the doctor looked at me and she said, you can cancel your tour. Mm. I said, I beg your pardon? She went, you can cancel your tour. She said, you're going nowhere. So when the news was passed on to my fiancé and then my sister and then my mother and father and they all sort of rallied around the bed and sort of looked and were mortified. but. It was time for me. I think that's a culmination of many years of build-up of extraordinary pain and going through things and trying to work things and being, you know. Your body does that on purpose. Yeah, and your body sort of just goes enough. Enough, you've got to rest. Enough, it's time for you to draw the curtains and just concentrate on you. You can't do it for yourself, your body will do it for you. Your body will, will absolutely do it for you. So that's what happened and... I'm getting ready to go on the road. Okay, so you are. It's, yeah. it's happening again because yeah. you, when you announced, you said to everyone, please keep your tickets. Yeah, I did. And th- I love that because it's so hopeful when your favourite artist says that. You're like, mm. I wish they're not going anywhere. They're just going to get better. Yeah, I was, and- I was going to get better because that was obviously my my inspiration was to be able to get better for, for myself yeah. so then, you know, everybody else. Yeah. And to be able to perform too because I'm at a different point in my life now where there is nothing to prove. There's just only beautiful moments to share. Yeah, and enjoy. And enjoy. So April the 6th I do the Adelaide Festival (gasps) Theatre. April the 26th and the 27th I'm at the Melbourne Town Hall. I'll be there with you. Which will be, yay, um, which will be beautiful. May the 11th there's I'll be performing at Hota which is an outdoor oh. festival on the Gold Coast, quite beautiful. Oh, yeah. And then for the adventurers, July the 2nd, the Big Red Bash, I'll be headlining in oh, Birdsville really? in the middle of the desert. Oh, that would be awesome. Where they go and camp for three days. Oh, God, that was my worst nightmare. Glamour, that. Well, I, don't know. I don't know if you'd I'll watch like your that stories. one. <laughs> I'll watch your stories. From air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, that would be magnificent, I, 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 I'm really looking yeah, forward to that yeah. because I've oh, only... just the backdrop only, of it. The backdrop's extraordinary. Oh, I've seen photos like, of yeah, it yeah. and I've just gone, oh, my God, I want to be a part of that. Yes, good. So I feel very... I feel really excited about doing that and just being free. Yeah. I think that's the thing that really excites me is the fact that I feel very free. I'm very liberal with my audience and nobody tells me what to do. No. When you've spent a lifetime with people Being, poking and yeah, prodding telling you, you what telling to do. you what to do or you should do this or you should do that, it's like at a certain point you go, i just got to do what feels right. Yeah, so yeah. that's what I do. I do what feels right. Yeah, and you have an intimate connection with your audience. Like you really do love them as much as they love oh, they've you. They've been extraordinary. They have. They absolutely have. They're eclectic. And they are. They're from all walks of they life. They are. I've all been cultures. in a few audiences and they're from everywhere. It's quite well. Mad. Appreciation of good music is that. It's an eclectic audience. It is. It is. Good music. Well, Get will anyone. bring people bring together. And that's, that's right. and that's what I love about that. What an extraordinary privilege to be able to work in a context where everybody walks away feeling really great. Really great. It's amazing. Thank you so much for your time. You're a gift, Evie. You're a gift. No, you're a gift. And the life is a present. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm a dag. You're amazing. I'm a dag. You are a dag. <laughs> yes, and I love how daggy you are because I'm a dag as well. I'm a big Everyone dag. is. And, and you know, if people aren't dags, they want to be. They just can't. I be. couldn't live my life like uh, no. uh, social media. No. And I just look at it and I laugh. I just think, oh my God, it's so not me. <laughs> and everyone, you know, my team's always, can you post something? Yeah. I'm like, yeah. do I have to? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, what you do is great. Th- I love you. I love you. Thank you. Very much. I know. Very Thank proud you. Of you. Thank you. Mm. I love you too, but <laughs> you get told that all the time, but I mean it too. But no, thank I you. No, I don't, Evie. Don't you? No. Oh, honey, no. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> You're a sweetheart. I think you are one of the strongest humans I've ever met in my life, and I'm so honoured to know you. Yeah, I feel the same. Thank you. Yeah. Love you, guts. Love you, guts.